Hi everyone and welcome to the second episode of the Chocolatier's Kitchen podcast series. I am Annette Smith, Calabout Lead Chef. In this series, we discuss how chefs and chocolatiers can deal with shelf life to give their customers the best possible experience. Today, I have two experts with me in the field. My first guest works in the Chocolate Academy Chicago, Martin Diaz. How are you? I'm very good, Minette. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Always happy to see you, Martin. Let me also welcome a colleague from Chocolate Academy, Milano, specialist in chocolate gelato and always in a good mood. Hi, Chiro. Hi, Minette. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And it's always a pleasure to talk about our work with colleagues. Great to have you both in the studio with me, chefs. The Chocolatier's Kitchen. After the book, listen to the podcast series about shelf life and confectionery products. Let me start with the topic of today. Confectionery products are complex products, usually involving multiple ingredients, recipes and processes. Now, each choice you make and each stage in processing have an impact on the shelf life of bonbons. From the day you start preparing the recipes to the day of consumption, a lot can happen inside those products. What are the most common issues that have an impact on the quality of the products, Martin? That's completely true, Minette, but it's not only about what's happening inside the bonbon. You can actually sometimes can see it outside. Uh, We talk about fat bloom or sugar bloom, for example. Now, fat bloom and sugar bloom are often confused. What exactly is the difference and how can you visually distinguish the difference between the two? There is a very easy way that you can have to see the difference between both. I usually take the bonbon and if you are able to remove with like only your thumb or the heat of your finger, this gray layer that you have on top of the bonbon, this is usually a fat bloom. So the fat is melting again and then you see it disappear. If with your thumb, you feel something granular or coarse, a kind of structure, you know it's a sugar bloom. So it means that the sugar has melted and recrystallized on top of your bonbon. So you can feel it a little bit like you could feel a sugar pieces. So apart from fat bloom and sugar bloom, how else does a too short shelf life become visible on the products? There is many ways of seeing that, Minette. You can have, for example, a loss of flavor. Imagine you do a ganache with passion fruit, and then after like a, a few days, there is no more like passion fruit taste. Or you can attract other flavor if you don't properly store your bonbon in the right place. Imagine you are close to salmon in the fridge, and then your bonbon is going to taste salmon. You don't want that. You know, then the product can dry also, you know, you can have a moisture absorption, uh, you can have an undesirable crystallization. There is like many ways to destroy your shelf life, basically based on the environment you're going to put your bonbon in. That's right, Martin. And actually, Minette, from the moment you start preparing your bonbon or filled bar, there's a lot more going on that can influence the quality and even the safety of your confectionery products. Those processes are less visible and really happen inside the ganache and the filling of the products. And they are tricky because you cannot see them from the outside. Think about, for example, the microbial spoilage due to the molds, the yeasts, the bacteria, or also the chemical spoilage due to the oxidation, no? the rancity of the fat, due to the air, simply you know, the contact with the air or because they are old. So you both touch on quite a few interesting points and from what I can hear, there's a lot that can go wrong over time and that can make your bonbons and bars less enjoyable and even less sellable. Now, what exactly influences those processes and eventually the shelf life of your products? So roughly you can split that in two categories. Uh, Let's make it easy. External factors that would influence the shelf life and also the speed of those processes of deterioration. I will take an example. Imagine like uh, the environment you work in is not completely safe. Then you start to have like bacteria around or your machine are not super clean, or the people that are making, for example, the ganache don't have clean hands. You know, that's a ton of examples that can already conduct to a deterioration of the shelf life because you are like actually adding some microbial spoilage or microbiological spoilage inside your ganache. 
then you have the storage or the technique of the production you are having. You know, we were talking about crystallization. Imagine you don't know anything about crystallization. You split ingredients together, you mix them, and then you think it's going to work. That might not work, you know, or the way you store your bonbon or the way you put your ganache in or the environment that it's going to be. So everything, all those type of factors is going to really influence your shelf life. And Martin, is there any way that you can control those external factors? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, uh, hey, to me, this is basic, but uh, hey, first, make sure that you work in a clean environment. Make sure that you sanitize properly the tools, the molds, the hands, whatever you're using. Uh, hey, something very easy if you have um, a ganache to make. Take a fresh cream, you know, like uh, hey, don't have a cream that have been open uh, in the fridge, for example. You you start from fresh, you make sure that everything is basic, and then you start to put in place processes. If you're not the only one doing ganaches, if you have a team, for example, start to do a checklist. Hey, make sure that the temperature of the lab is good, make sure that everything is clean around, make sure that everyone is respecting the processes. And then when you combine ingredients together, this is always good to have a, a temperature, you know, like a, what is the temperature you're going to melt your cream or your liquid at? When do you pour those liquids on the chocolate? Will the chocolate be melted? And if it is melted, at what temperature is it melted? Or will the chocolate be just in pistols, you know? So everything like that is very important. And then you start to have a checklist of processes and you make sure that everyone is respecting that. That's the best way to have something regular. What you don't want as well is, for example, having a production one, you make a fantastic vanilla bonbon, let's say, and then a few months later, you need to make another batch and it tastes completely different because you have not infused the vanilla, you have not combined the ingredients the same way. So you re you result on having something completely different. Then the consumer might not be happy. It's not a problem of shelf life in this case. It's a problem of like flavors or loss of flavor. Those type of things are very important. That's really interesting. Now, Chiro, apart from the first category of external factors that influence the shelf life, I take it that the second category comprises factors that influence how the filling or ganache behave from the inside. That's completely right, Minette. The way you compose your recipes or the ingredients you use may impact the shelf life as well. For example, you need to consider um, the balance of your recipe. So each ingredient has its own composition if your recipe is well balanced, you cannot change an ingredient to the other. For example, you cannot take out uh, from your recipe a raspberry puree and replace it uh, easily with lemon juice because you're going to have a different composition of sugar, for example, a different pH. So your ganache is going to behave completely different and at the same time you can really hurt your, uh, your chef life as well. So the balancing, of course, is something quite complicated to go through in, uh, in a podcast. But it's something really important that, from my experience, uh, the artisan has to consider really well and stick to the exactly same ingredients mentioned in, the, in your recipe. In the Chocolatier's Kitchen, we did a lot of work on that. Uh, with uh, all the other colleagues, we actually worked on the chef life of Bonbon, no? separating different short, medium and long chef life. Simply working on uh, some parameters that are really, really important and crucial, like, for example, the water activity. So that we know it's very important to the activity of the water and how some ingredients like, for example, the sugar or the alcohol uh, can impact, you know, the, the water activity. Because basically the, the sugar is going to bind the water and it's going to keep the water safe from the bacteria. So there's a lot going on in uh, your ganache that you cannot see from the outside, but uh, you really need to stick to the right recipe, did it in a proper way and... Uh, in Chocolatier's Kitchen, we did an incredible job in this way. So I think really this is a precious work done from all of us. What you're saying is very interesting, Chiro. And, um, and I think it's very important to understand all those parameters and what can influence the shelf life. But imagine, put yourself in the shoes of a chocolatier working in a restaurant that want to serve like a, in a three-star restaurant, a perfect bonbon or a mise en bouche, but like a kind of chocolate mise en bouche is going to reach for a very short shelf life, something like a few days maybe. And this chef can hollow himself to put like a fresh herbs, for example, inside that you're gonna chop like a basil with a lemon, something very freshy, very fantastic. And obviously, if you do that in a chocolate shop and you wanna reach a three month shelf life, you know that um, this herb's gonna spoil and, and it's gonna 
create moisture and maybe destroy your shelf life. So understanding those parameters will help you to create the perfect bonbon for the perfect consumer. You want to reach a different shelf life based on the type of business you're having. If you want to sell and you're in semi-industrial, you want to put like your bonbon in a grocery store for like a few months. Or if you're a pure chocolatier and you want to have like fresh bonbon that has a three-month shelf life. Or if you are like a chef in a hotel, those parameters are very important. They are very important, but you will play with that differently. Your balance is going to be different. Your pH can be different. Your activity of water is going to be different. You need to understand what it is. You need to understand those parameters, but you can play with them. Right. That sounds very interesting from what I just heard. Now, Chiro, it sounds like there's a lot of things happening from the inside that you don't see. How could you as a chocolatier get your grip on that? Well, actually, Minette, we always need to go to the basics. I mean, as we said previously, uh, follow the recipe, the right ingredients. The method you use to make your uh, your preparation actually is really crucial, no? The impact of uh, maybe, let's say, pasteurizing your recipe or not. And also the cleanness. I mean, you need to work in a safe environment. I mean, these all are basics, actually, of our work. But we really need to stick to that. And always, from my experience, I, I travel a lot. I see a lot of colleagues. I'm a lucky man that, you know, I have a lot of uh, experience on that. And uh, always I find they don't really respect sometimes the basis of our work. So this is really crucial. Well, that's a good point. It's really in the basics, isn't it? Yeah, and I think uh, I, the fantastic job of the Chocolatier's Kitchen was to show what you can do with like a basic recipe, with a short shelf life, a midterm, and a longer one. But let's touch on something, for example, Minette, that can completely influence a recipe is infusion. Imagine you take a, a star anise, and this star anise, they're spoiled, they're full of germs, and you want to infuse that to create a, a very tasty ganache. If you put them like that in your cream, your water, or whatever, or your, or your milk, and expect to have a longer shelf life, that might not work. So a little trick, some people might put that like 30 seconds in the microwave to kill the germs, uh, to go for an infusion. Other people will do other type of quick infusions just to make sure that everything you use, every based on the basic recipe, every ingredient you had, every infusion you make, you try not to bring a microbial spoilage, you know, I have a very difficult time with this word. But this is what you don't want is add germs <laughs> and reduce the shelf life. <laughs> I see what you mean. Now, that's quite helpful, Martin. So if I get it right, chefs, many of those processes, like the fast development of microbacteria or the appearance of fat bloom, can often be avoided by taking good hygiene and storage measures, right? So, Martin, can you give us some good examples of good storage practices? Yeah, I remember one day I had a customer that told me, Martin, I have two shops. I have one shop, I have no problem with fat bloom, no problem with sugar bloom, and this is where we produce our chocolate. And then I have another shop, which is like 30 kilometers far from the first one. And when we move the chocolate and we sell them in this shop, I have a loss of shelf life, but it is tremendous. I can lose one month. And I was like, but are you having a temperature control all day long? And he said, obviously not, because we have to take the bonbon and then to transport them to another location, the other location, I'm not temperature control. And so on. I was like, okay, the worst thing you can have with a bonbon is not having temperature control. It's sometimes store at 16 Celsius, and then the day after you're at 24 and back to 16. What you're just doing here is that the fat are changing their crystallization all time long, all day long. And then you start to create fat bloom, for example. Or imagine that you're not temperature controlled, but you have a lot of humidity because, I don't know, because you are, you are having a shop close to the sea, for example, and there is like a lot of humidity over there. This humidity will also impact your bonbon. Or imagine you put your bonbon in the fridge because you want to be on temperature control or it's a high temperature, but in your fridge, it's not well protected. So your bonbon can also soak the humidity from the fridge. They can soak odors from the fridge if you have other ingredients. And I think this is very important. So it's all about having like the right packaging, temperature control, humidity control, and the, the right storage area. And once you have that, once you are happy with what you have, try to stick to that. Try to let your bonbon stay in a proper environment without a change of temperature, without a change of humidity. So, Martin, can you maybe tell us what are the ideal storage conditions for your products? Yeah, of course. I'm going to list a couple of them. 
And obviously, as I will list some, other people will think that there is other. But I think here, this is a clear guideline. If you want to store your bonbons um, outside of a fridge or a freezer, you need to be at 16 Celsius temperature with a 55% hygrometry. I always recommend to use perfect box for bonbon, not cupboard box, not anything that can give a taste. So some packaging, when you open your packaging, you get a smell. You don't want to have your bonbon inside because bonbon is full of fat and fat's going to keep the others. But you can also use something which is more modern, like a freezing, for example. Imagine you have a production of bonbon. You let them crystallize for 24 hours. You put that in a packaging and you make sure that your box is completely full. You don't leave any space for air. And then you close it tight, you wrap it, and then you put that in the freezer. The way you will unfreeze it is that you take it out for 12 hours in the fridge, let it come back to uh, temperature 6 degrees, and then for after those 12 hours, back at room temperature, 16 degrees, and 55% hygrometry. And only at this moment, you unwrap and you open your box, you know. And some other people might use another modern uh, um, way of storing their bonbon, which is like oxygen control. So it's basically the same as the, the freezing, but you're going to put like uh, any product inside that can transform your oxygen in order to increase the shelf life and reduce any type of bacteria that you can have in the air. I think these for me are the best way of storing bonbon and the, 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 those ways going to give you like the longest shelf life. Well, that gives me already some good insights in good storage conditions to look into the shelf life of your products. Now, good hygiene practices is the second big bucket of measures you can take, right Shiro? Yeah, completely right, Minette. The things you could do are, uh, as you said before, the basis of our work, which is cleaning up all the table, uh, work with clean tools, and of course, you know, to respect the pasteurization process, you know, for example, in our method. So whilst doing the recipe, we have a certain temperature. It's crucial to make sure that we stick to that temperature in a fast way, of course, uh, going up fast and uh, going down really fast, so cool down very fast uh, so that we are really sure that we reduce the bacteria in our products. There are some aspects to consider. Let's say, for example, you're, you're doing a, a long-term ganache. For example, I love to clean up all of my container, also the cutter with some alcohol. I always have some alcohol, pure alcohol around, just to make sure really that uh, this cutter, this tool is perfectly clean and uh, you don't have problem because once you Tied up the container with uh, the with alcohol. See, a few seconds, alcohol will, uh, will go, will evaporate, and uh, your tool is safe. No bacteria, no smell. I don't like to use chemicals in this kind of products, you know, because there are some chemicals, but I don't really like it, because I always think that uh, they leave some, some stuff inside. It. They're, they're not, they are not, let's say, 100% you know, safe. I mean, they, they, some um, residual stuff is going to stay on the surface. From my point of view, in the container, always some alcohol is a nice uh, thing to do. So there are different parameters to consider. Uh, some of them are similar, but uh, the gelato, I think, it's, uh, it's the future for the chocolatier. Chiro, so you've mentioned about the different shelf life, and also in the chocolatier's kitchen, there's different recipes with different shelf lives when it comes to gelato. Can you explain a little bit the difference between the short shelf life recipe versus medium shelf life versus long shelf life when it comes to gelato in the book? Uh, in the book, you can find three different chef life. As we said, not for uh, really, it's just a matter of texture. Because we know that, for example, if you keep a gelato at minus 12 degrees, uh, which is a serving temperature, of course, uh, your structure is going to be okay, perfect, for, uh, for a few days, five, six days. After, you're going you're gonna to have big crystals of ice and uh, the gelato is still safe but not as nice as it would before, because the crystal are gonna get bigger and bigger, so not gonna be so creamy anymore. So that's why when you keep gelato at that temperature, you have a certain amount of days, but once you keep your gelato in the right temperature, minus 18, minus 20, minus 22, you can keep the gelato for one year. If you think about industrial gelato, you can keep it for two years. But always, as Martin said before, keeping at right temperature, in the stable right temperature, not going up and down, up and down, up and down. Because in gelato, you're going to have the water uh, melting and after the water freeze again. So it's going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So not smooth anymore in your mouth. 
Okay, so Chiro, Martin, I can go on for hours when it comes to shelf life, but let's wrap up today's conversation. And just from my side, a few interesting points that I took from this. A lot can go wrong when it comes to shelf life on the outside, as well as on the inside, what you can't see. Also really important was the environment where you produce your products and the hygiene that you apply when you produce your products. And then lastly, what was really interesting as well was the different parameters that you need to consider when it comes to producing gelato and the shelf life on that. And that's really based on the texture of the gelato. So once again, Martin, Chiro, thank you for great insights and great inputs. Hey, you're welcome, Minet. It's always fun to share, but I learn a lot today, so it's always fun to learn as well. Indeed, Minet. Great if we can share our experience, especially in a such complex topic like chef life. The Chocolatier's Kitchen. After the book, listen to the podcast series about shelf life and confectionery products. This was it for today's podcast. Don't miss out on the next one where we will share a little bit more on the ingredients that go inside the recipe and the role that they play when it comes to shelf life. Take care and let's hear each other soon.